Uh, under the Veterans Ministry. In the parking lot, taking up collection, counting attendance. I've greeted for eight o'clock service. We're serving the puppets. Global. We sing in a choir. I'm a deacon. In the kitchen and the store. Coffee ministry. It's running air conditioners, making sure everything works. Open doors every Sunday morning, every Saturday. Doing uh, video cameras. And and I always do VBS. Kids church. Coffee, kiosk. Coffee. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what gave it away. Yeah. Start cars, break into cars. For good reason, yeah. I haven't delivered a baby yet. I'm working on that. God asks us to do it, so we do it. I'm serving the Lord. And it's important to not only, you know, be in a relationship with God, but to be in a relationship with other believers. Well, there's a good camaraderie. You to meet people and learn faces. Community. Um, I enjoy the people. I enjoy the fellowship. It's a good way to start the day. It's fulfilling. It feels awesome to have been able to help someone else. So it's like a release for me. I've been through tough things in my life, so I hope I can give back in a meaningful way. I want it to be a good experience for him. I want him to feel safe. Well, several of you were given some electronic devices when you walked in. Let me see the hands of those who have those electronic devices, all right? These electronic devices are going to help us accentuate a certain point in this sermon. Now, the p persons uh, who have these electronic devices have no idea what they've gotten themselves into. <laughs> they don't know the questions, and they don't know the answers. So you're going to see their responses in real time. And in order to make sure that this is working correctly, let me start with a deep theological question. Those who have the electronic devices, help us decide. Brett Spiegelman wants to wear a new hairstyle this summer. He's thinking either of being totally bald, ponytail, or leave perfection alone. Let's see. All right. Oh, hmm. Hmm. All right, so Brett can leave perfection alone. All right. Brett is of the mindset that he said that God only chose so many people to make ball and the rest he covered up their imperfections with hair. That's what he says. All right. Uh, all seriousness aside, some of you catch that on the way home. You can. <clears throat> How large is our facility? How large is our facility? 385,000 square feet, about four football fields, or about seven football fields. How large is the facility? Okay. The answers are actually A and C. Most got that right. Uh, 385,000 square feet, God has blessed us to be with. That's about half the size of the FedEx Forum. So it's a big place to take care of. All right, here's another question. How many times are toilets joyfully scrubbed by our volunteers each week? The operative word is joyfully. All right, we have, okay. And the answer is A, 178 joyful scrubs by our volunteers. All right, here's another one. How much money do we give to local and global missions because of the money-saving efforts of our faithful scrubs' involvement? How much money are we able to save because of our faithful scrubbing volunteers? <clears throat> the answer is indeed A, $150,000, because we can operate, that's a good place to say amen. All right, here's another one. How many children ages two months to 10 years do we serve each weekend in our children's church and Sunday school? How many do we serve ages two months to 10 years old in our children's church and Sunday school? Oh, this is a sharp group. A, 
B.C. C is right. Between 750 and 850 children we have the privilege to serve each weekend. And then lastly, how many people with developmental disabilities do we serve each weekend so caregivers can benefit from worship? <clears throat> how many people with developmental disabilities do we serve each weekend so that our caregivers or their caregivers can benefit from an hour or so of worship? And again, this must be a Mensa group. They got it right again. 50 persons every single weekend. All of these point to the subject matter of today. We're talking about day one, sort of week three. What did the disciples do after the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Well, two weeks ago, Eli talked to us about starting point. And he told us that spiritual growth is a process. They grew spiritually as a process. Spiritual growth is not a sprint, it's a marathon. And then we, last week, I talked about the engine for that growth, and that is the Bible, the Word of God. It is the reason that we grow. The Bible, the Word of God, is food for our soul. It is soul food. That's the reason that we, we grow when we hear these words of his. This week, I'm going to talk about service because whatever else these early disciples did after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, they were involved in study and they were involved in service. And so I want to challenge us this weekend to make sure that all of us are involved in some type of service. The two particular areas I want to talk about particularly have to do with our children and our campus. Our children and our campus. As you have seen before, we have 385,000 square feet as far as our campus is concerned. It takes a lot of people to keep it clean and pristine, and particularly our Scrubs Ministries allows us to do that. We can operate on a skeletal crew in terms of hired people. We don't have to pay uh, six figures to a janitorial uh, service because of your volunteering because of the Scrubs Ministries, we're able to save that money and then invest it in people, that is global and local missions. And so I want to challenge us with our discretionary time. How are we doing when it relates to service, sort of in reach on this campus? Because ladies and gentlemen, we have a perception problem. That's something that's written in your notes. We have a perception problem problem. Most people who come to the campus see that God has blessed us with a large campus and think that their money or their time or their talent really won't matter very much. Nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, the reason that we can operate with a high degree of dignity and honor toward God, bringing him glory, is because of the people who are involved. We have a perception problem, and if we're not careful, we will think that it's all taken care of by other people. We certainly don't want to be a church. You've heard the old adage, where 20% of the people do 80% of the work. We could not function that way, and thank God we are not that way. But this is a sermon of reminder when it relates to our children and our campus to overcome the perception problem. This is a privilege that we have. It can be a problem without your help. We need every single person to be involved in some type of service, particularly focusing today on our campus through Scrubs Ministry and our children uh, ministry. Now, it can be other areas of ministries as well. Don't ever think that you are not M. In fact, if you took one alphabet, 
from our alphabetical system, it will change the way we communicate. If you took one digit from our numerical system, it will change the way we calculate. If you took two teeth from your mouth, it will change the way you chew. Every teeth, tooth, teethis is important. <laughs> Every one. Particularly as I march toward chronological maturity, I understand my teethis are important. I should have listened to my dentist when he said, be true to your teeth and they'll never be false to you. If one player is not on a basketball team of five people, it would change the game. One player not on an 11 person football team, it would change the game. One person who is not on a nine person baseball team, it would change the game. And if I am sitting on the sidelines as a spectator here in our church or a uh, and not a contributor, it will impact our ability to operate with a high degree of dignity, effectiveness, and honor by bringing glory to God. So let me focus on how we serve each other. There is a passage in Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. It says this, My friends, you were chosen to be free. So don't use your freedom as an excuse to do anything you want. Use it as an opportunity to serve each other with love. The boy says it this way. Brothers and sisters, God has called you to freedom. Same verse. Hear the call. And do not spoil this gift by using your liberty to engage in what uh, with your flesh desires. Instead, use it to serve each other as Jesus taught us through love. That's what these early disciples did after the resurrection. They poured their lives out serving each other. Now, all of us have physical chores that we're familiar with. And then we have spiritual chores. That's also in your notes. Physical chores to keep the family functioning. We also have spiritual chores to keep the family functioning. And some of these spiritual chores are done out of duty. And as they're menial, I don't particularly like them, but I do them in order to keep the family functioning. And then some I do out of delight. They are because of my spiritual gifts, my interests, my passions, and God has gifted me in an area, and I do it. I love to do it. I'll make time to do it. So we serve out of duty or delight, but both are godly and necessary. All of us had physical chores, very likely growing up, that we had to do to keep the family going. My physical chore, one of them, was to bake the cornbread every single day. And I baked cornbread every single day, six days a week, because my stepfather loved buttermilk and cornbread. Anybody ever heard of that concoction? Buttermilk and cornbread. He ate it every single day without fail. So I had to bake the cornbread. I got so sick of cornbread every single day, six days a week. I told God, when I get grown, I'm never going to eat cornbread, let alone bake it ever again. And when I left my mama's house, I almost kept that promise. I, three times in my life, I have eaten cornbread since I left my mama's house. That was my physical chore. All of you have those kind of chores, and I did it out of duty to help keep the family going. It was my contribution. It was not out of delight. And there are some services that we do out of delight. So let me give you these three reasons uh, how we ought to use our freedom in order to serve God and serve each other particularly as it relates to our campus and our children. Number one, don't misuse your freedom for things that don't focus 
on the eternal. Don't misuse your freedom, my freedom, our freedom, for those things that do not focus on the eternal. Here's how Jesus said it, Matthew 6. Don't hoard treasure down here where it gets eaten by moths, corroded by rust, or worse, stolen by burglars. Instead, he said, stockpile treasure in heaven. Stockpile treasure in heaven where it is safe from moth and from rust and from burglars. And so when I serve, I am stockpiling treasure in heaven that I will enjoy on the other side. So I have a responsibility, Paul says to these Galatians, to not misuse my freedom. Now they had the luxury to be free in Christ. They were not bound by the law. Some of the things that other religions were um, challenging them to do. Uh, Christianity is a relationship. It's, it's not keeping a set of rules and regulations. So they gave them a certain degree of freedom. Here in the West, in particular in America, we have freedom of mobility. So we have double freedom. My challenge is, as Paul says, how am I using that freedom, my discretionary time, my leisure time? Don't misuse it, he says, by not focusing on that which is eternal. The only thing eternal are people. That's the only thing eternal. How much of my time am I using to invest in people? That's stockpiling treasure in heaven. So how am I doing that? Now those who keep these kind of statistics tell us about a third of Americans spend one to three hours in mindless, fun, leisure, or uh, in front of a television or radio or computer or uh, any type of other electronic entertainment. Another third of us spend four to six hours per day involved in using our freedom and leisure time. And some even spend eight hours plus per day with some type of electronic or audio, uh, audible entertainment. None of that invest in those things that are internal if we're not careful. So don't misuse that freedom. Here's a second one. Don't abuse my freedom. Don't abuse our freedom for just those things that relate to me and mine. That's an abuse of freedom when I'm using it just for me and mine. Now, I certainly need to take care of myself and my family. After all, Jesus says, love your neighbor as you love your, you got to love yourself so you can love your neighbor. The last time you were on an airplane, they probably said something like this. If the cabin loses compression, an oxygen mask will drop down and put the mask on somebody else before you put it... No, it says put the mask where? On yourself and then help somebody else. And so it's necessary for me to focus on me. But I should not abuse my freedom by focusing all of my discretionary le leisure or recreational time on me or mine. The text says I should be serving others, particularly as it relates to our children. Children in the ancient world were not as highly esteemed. They were important and people loved them, uh, but they were not as highly esteemed. In fact, one day the disciples, a group of children, wanted to come and just meet Jesus. They were fascinated by him, of course. They just wanted to interact with him and they shooed them away and said, no, he doesn't have time for you. That was the basic mindset of children in the ancient world. And then Jesus said this, Matthew 19, he said to his disciples, but Jesus says, no, 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 no. Let the little children 
come to me. Do not hinder them. For to such belong the kingdom of heaven. I am approachable, and I want these children to come to me. So in our children's ministry that serves between 750 to 850 children per weekend, you can see that we have ample opportunity to serve each other by ministering to our children. Otherwise, we could be guilty of hindering them, putting obstacles, roadblocks, not giving opportunities for them to come to learn about him. So we need every single person in order to help us with this ministry toward children. We don't want to be guilty of 20% of the people doing 80% of the work so that we all are ministering to our children. So don't abuse your freedom by focusing on just me and mine. How many of you have ever heard of Sunday school? <coughs> of course you have. But maybe you are not familiar with the history of Sunday school. And let me give you the history of Sunday school. This may be a reminder for others, for some, and revelation for others. In 1781, Robert Reichs, a professional printer by trade, not a preacher, a pastor, in Gloucester, England, took seriously Jesus' admonition of Matthew 19, 14, to let nothing hinder little children from coming to him. Robert Reichs is credited with cre uh, creating the term uh, the institution of Sunday school or school on Sundays. He was assisted by the Reverend Thomas Stott. Now, Robert Reichs was a Jesus follower and a devout member of the Anglican Church in England at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution in the late 1700s, about the time of the Revolutionary War here in America. England had a large underclass of poor people who had moved from the countryside to the city to work in factories. Factories was a new phenomena back in that day. Children as young as eight years old worked six days a week in the gruesome surroundings for pennies. Sometimes when their tiny hands got caught in the machinery and were cut off, they were simply dumped into the streets. Remember, there was no free schooling in the 1700s. Children worked on farms and in factories and were almost as illiterate as African slaves. Uh, academics were taught in individual homes, not in the community like we have today. Only families with enough money could really afford to send their children to school. Poor and working class families, children did not read or write. Literacy was not nearly as important. However, Sunday was the one day that children did not have to go to work in the factories. And as a result, to kind of blow off steam, they had that free day. They wandered around town. They started picking pockets, breaking windows, robbing homes while people were away at church. And there was this endless cycle of negative behavior and poverty. These gains sparked a vision and a burden in Robert Wright's heart, the printer. He saw the lack of education and their dead-end life of poverty and turn into crime as something that Christian folk should be concerned about. So he got an idea. His idea was simple. Why not start a school on Sundays for poor and working class children where Christians could come and teach them to read and to write plus teach them biblical morals by which to live by. So Wrights started a Sunday school for under-resourced children who were as overlooked in his day as they were in Jesus' day. The parents could not pay for school like the wealthy, so Reichs used his own money and paid for the first school teacher and the curriculum himself. He also volunteered his own time and recruited other Anglican church members 
in order to help and contribute their time and their money. Since he was a printer, Reichs published large sheets of curriculum, alphabets, number, uh, numbers, as well as Bible verses. Note, his primary aim was academic literacy with a secondary aim of biblical education, knowing that both would improve the quality of life for these kids. By 1811, 400,000 kids were enrolled in Sunday school throughout England. By 1831, one million kids were enrolled in attending school on Sunday. Meanwhile, in America, the school on Sunday or the Sunday school movement also met a great need and gained in popularity. It was first adopted in 1790 by the Quakers in Philadelphia and then by female pioneers Isabella Graham and Joanne Bethune of New York. So that by 1832, there were 8,000 Sunday schools in America. And by 1899, 10 million children were enrolled in Sunday school or schools on Sunday, long before that was compulsory education that was imposed by the government. Christians of their own money and time took compassion on children and created school on Sunday. He took seriously, we must take seriously, don't abuse it. And the last thing I want to say is this. Not only don't misuse for things that are not eternal and don't abuse focusing on me and mine, but Paul says now do use your freedom to serve others through love. Galatians 6.2 says this, shoulder each other's burdens and then you will live as the law of the anointed who taught us, the anointed being Jesus. Shoulder each other's burdens. That's what he did for us. This word burdens in the Greek is overwhelming burdens. Now, all of us have to shoulder our own responsibility, but in a church our size, 750 to 850 children with 50 children with, um, who are in families with developmental disabilities, it's an overwhelming burden that we are called to shoulder for each other. So my challenge for you today and for me is we need 122 volunteers, 122 volunteers to sign up this week in order to help us. We need 62 with our typical children. We need 30 for our families with developmental disabilities, and we need another 30 to help us with our campus or scrubs ministry in order to, for us to operate at a high degree of dignity, 122, so that we can all share in using our time by serving each other through love. And so some of your, your comment cards were held back. If you are so moved, you can write down your information legibly, write down your contact information, and give it to those who are in the back. Or you can um, fill out the Hope app comment card, as the options are there before you. Or you can go to one of the connecting crews that are in the foyer and sign up for service there, or you can go to hopechurchmemphis.com forward slash volunteers. And you can do this quarterly, you can do it monthly, you can do it bi-monthly, or you can do it weekly, weekly, W-E-E-K-L-Y. <laughs> you don't have to be a preacher, or you don't have to be a pastor. You can be a speaker and teach, Curriculum is already there for you. It's already printed. You don't have to think it up. You can sing, and you don't have to sing like the front line in front of our kids. They just like a joyful noise. You can play the guitar. You can be silly and act in theater. I know some of you can be silly. And I know some of you. And it's easy. Yeah, he's pointing at his wife. Say, yeah, she can be silly. You can clean. And more importantly, you can shadow. We call shadow, that is simply being present, particularly for those families with developmental disabilities 
being present. Can you imagine having one or two children who have these developmental disabilities and they can come for an hour or so and relax and worship because we're serving each other. They have to go back for the next 23, 24 hours, 22 hours. It's an overwhelming burden at times. So thank you in advance. Serving through love. I'll close with this. Here's the simple definition of love. Love is the setting aside of my selfish situation to seek the best good of the object of my concern in a spirit of self-sacrifice with a minimum of emotion but a maximum of evaluation, doing what needs to be done even when I don't feel like doing it. That's love. I'll say it again. It's setting aside my selfish situation to seek the best good of the object of my concern in a spirit of self-sacrifice. Clue, doing what needs to be done even when I don't feel like doing it. That's how we serve each other in love. And we serve him at the same time. Pray with me if you would. Gracious God, our Father, we pray that some would take up the challenge as they evaluate their time, their freedom, and that you would help us not to simply be spectators, but to be contributors, and to do our part to help keep our family of faith functioning with a high degree of dignity, effectiveness, and glory to you. Some may have time to volunteer only on special events like VBS or like Fall Fun Fest or Easter egg hunts. Some have time to do something monthly like respites. Some have time to do something every other week. And some of us, our situations and stages in life have changed that we could do something every week, particularly as it relates to our campus and our children. Help us not to hinder them and to make every opportunity available. So I pray that you would help us not to misconstrue that because of our size, my help is not as important. Thank you for helping us by shouldering, carrying our overwhelming burden of sin. And when we do it for others, we fulfill the law of Christ by serving others through love, which means doing what we don't feel like doing oftentimes. We pray this in the name of the King of kings and Lord of lords, even Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.